I'm Sam Biederman. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon. I'm here at Restore Orthopedics and Spine. I specialize primarily in scoliosis, spinal deformities in adults and in children. Tonight we're here for the first lecture series at Restore Orthopedics and Spine. It's a learning series and we're here talking about spine surgery, spinal conditions, and some new innovations in treatment. So just to start out, um, it's important to understand the overall anatomy of the spine. And there's two components. There's the structure and then obviously there's the function, what it does. So what does the spine do? Well, it allows us to move, to bend, to flex, and allows allows us to kind of stand upright and walk. Obviously important functions. The other thing <clears throat> that it does is it houses the electrical system for the body. And so spinal cord, nerves, most of the nerves that come through the cervical spine in your neck travel down the arms and similarly those that come out of the lumbar spine travel down the legs. There's also innervation and nerve supply to organs primarily through the thoracic segments. So it's got kind of an important job. So what does the spine do? Well, it allows us to kind of stand upright. It allows us to move and walk. It protects the nerves. And then the other thing it's supposed to do is not hurt. Okay, and if it can do all of those things, it's doing the right thing and it's working. So what about when things start to go bad? And this is where we see problems such as wear and tear and degeneration. And so degeneration can come in many different forms. This is kind of a, a cartoon showing kind of different levels of degeneration from a normal disc, maybe a little bit of a degenerated disc, bulging of the disc or herniations, or even complete degeneration and collapse. And there's a variety of different pictures here showing a dehydrated or degenerated disc in cross-section, kind of looking through the disc. This is a side view where you can see some bulging of the disc causing pressure on the nerves and spinal cord. And as the disc thins, you start to lose normal curvature and it starts to curve the other way. Or here, bone spurs that form right at the level of the disc cause some pinching of the nerves, which can obviously cause problems either with the nerve not functioning or the nerve causing pain. And here are some other cases looking at a specific condition where there's not only just degeneration, arthritis, wear and tear, but even sometimes instability where levels start to shift abnormally like this one is sliding forward on this one. And when you have that translation, these little nerves that are stuck in between can get pinched because of that shearing effect. And that condition is called spondylolisthesis, a very common condition that we see. Uh, great for Scrabble, I'm not sure you can fit that all on one thing. Another condition that I see quite commonly is scoliosis. Most people have heard of that relating to kids and adolescents as they're growing, but scoliosis can develop in adulthood just related to wear and tear, and that's if those discs or those levels start to wear out asymmetrically, maybe a little bit more on the right than on the left, and that can result in some curvatures to the spine, as you can see down here in the x-ray, and then in more severe examples here, you can see severe curvatures like this patient here with a clinical photo. So just to back up, what are the symptoms of the aging or degenerating spine? Well, it may result in back pain, may result in leg pain where the nerve may get pinched. It could result in other nerve problems like numbness or weakness. We may have trouble standing up straight. Uh, and then stiffness, which is probably not the biggest problem, but something that some people do complain about from time to time. So how common is it? Well, it's pretty common. Uh, seven in 10 of us will probably experience some episode of back pain in our lifetime. Probably not as severe as some of those uh, cases that I showed you. But it is a big problem and the rate is expected to increase. So if we look at that severe example of adult scoliosis, which is quite a severe example here, in people that are over 50, about 9% of the population is expected to have some element of degenerative scoliosis. In people that come into the office complaining of back pain is about 8%. And if you're over 50 and you have back pain, depending on the studies you look at, it's been estimated even up to about two-thirds of people may have some element of degenerative scoliosis. So how does that affect them? Well, this was a study done a number of years ago 
comparing patients with these spinal problems to other groups that are matched by age and gender and uh, compared with other conditions. So if you look at you know, how do these spine patients do compared to patients with cancer, uh, COPD, heart failure, or patients that have end-stage arthritis of their hip and knee needing hip or knee replacement, these, this is a, a score of function, so the lower they are, the worse they are. They're worse than patients with cancer, COPD, heart failure, and they're kind of in the same range of those with end-stage knee and hip arthritis. Certainly much better than kind of a normal population. So these patients are affected, they are debilitated, and it's a big problem. So what are treatment options? Well, there's a variety of treatment options. All you have to do is look on the internet and you'll see dozens and dozens of treatments. Chiropractic treatment, I think it's evolved a little bit since this. Uh, physical therapy, there's cognitive therapy, uh, medications, injections, there's uh, neuromodulation, spinal cord stimulators, and then obviously surgery. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the surgical perspective, but just acknowledge there's a lot of different treatments and some of them work very, very well for different patients depending on what their conditions are. Surgery really is reserved for a select minority of patients. And as I was trying to allude to uh, earlier on the last slide, most patients really are dealt well with non-surgical treatment. That really is the mainstay of treatment and for many of them they get significant improvement. However, there is a small group of people that end up needing surgery uh, either because their condition is so severe or they really have gone through extensive non-surgical treatments without really any uh, effect. So I, I will acknowledge that as a surgeon we do get a bad rap. There's obviously a lot of bad press about spine surgery. We do have this, this problem to deal with. We get Newsweek uh, headlines and other problems. This was a, an article in the New England Journal talking about restraint in terms of spinal fusion surgery. And I want to talk a little bit about why. First, it's important to understand what we do with surgery. There's really three things that we accomplish. And I kind of put these two in small font, hoping you probably couldn't really read it from the back of the room. But there's really three main things. We'll either decompress when nerves are being pinched or being compressed from structures like the disc, like the joint, bone spurs. We may fuse or stabilize segments of the spine if they're sliding around or unstable. And then if there's a significant problem with the alignment, then we can kind of realign things. Either they're slipped, we bring it back into position, or it's crooked and we straighten it out. And that's essentially all we do uh, with the spine. We may do a combination of them, we may do one or two. Now there are some techniques to do some repair or replacement, like disc replacement, there's even some facet replacements, or trying to repair things, for instance, with chronic fractures. But that's really a minority of cases and certainly not the standard of what we do. So here's the problem with what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. People consider spinal problems as back pain and synonymous, and they think that back pain is a diagnosis in and of itself, which clearly it's not. It's a symptom. So you might experience back pain, but back pain is not really a diagnosis. And the analogy that I like to think of is chest pain. No one would say, well, your diagnosis is you have chest pain. You know, the whole field of internal medicine is designed to figure out what is causing the chest pain. So, you know, is it a heart attack, angina, pulmonary embolism? I mean, there's all these things. The entire field of internal medicine is designed to figure out what the diagnosis is. And no one says your diagnosis is chest pain. Well, unfortunately, we haven't been that successful in trying to convince the mainstream that there are different problems related to back pain. But as I was showing you some of those examples and pictures before, there's very different conditions that can cause back pain, and back pain clearly is not a diagnosis, in my view. And the treatment of these things may differ depending on what's going on structurally with related to, uh, related to the spine. So this was a study done uh, a while ago, about eight, eight years ago, uh, nine years ago, that looked at all of the evidence available for spine fusion surgery, and they kind of looked at back pain. And again, keep in mind, this is not really a diagnosis. But what they came up with was 
they said, well, maybe it's a little bit better than non-surgical care when you've got chronic back pain, but it's really not better than some other treatments like behavioral therapy, which is essentially a cognitive treatment. So their overall um, summary was that it really wasn't that great. Now that's analogous to saying, well, coronary bypass surgery is okay or good when you've got chest pain, but may not be any better than Tums. Now, clearly these treatments are totally different and it depends on what the underlying condition is. So, some other studies that have looked at this exact problem have found that, yeah, your outcome is different depending on what underlying condition you may have. And so, if you've got this condition, which is the spondylolisthesis, a slip of L4 and L5, you've got bone on bone here, and the nerves are pinched, these people do very well with surgery, whereas a patient here with just a degenerative disc, no collapse, no pinched nerve, they do okay. And if you just come in with back pain and everything else is normal, you're probably not going to do that well with surgery. And so once you tease this issue out, you see that outcomes differ depending on what the underlying condition really is. So then there was a study that came about uh, about five or six years ago, maybe a little longer. This was the sports study. And this was about a $15 million NIH study that looked at several conditions. But just to show you some of the results from one of these conditions. And this is pr uh, published in the New England Journal. So certainly not a, uh, you know, a small time uh, journal. And this was looking at surgical versus non-surgical treatment for that one condition, degenerative spondylolisthesis. And what they found was that patients that were treated surgically had a substantially greater improvement in terms of their pain, their function, even up to five years compared to those that treat, were treated non-surgically. And this is after they had gone through non-surgical treatment, making them surgical candidates. So clearly there is randomized, what we consider level one evidence to suggest that for specific conditions, surgery does extremely well. And you know this fusion surgery, which we're going to talk about a little bit more uh, coming up, can be done in a variety of different ways, can be done minimally invasively, uh, it generally requires a fairly limited inpatient um, surgical stay. As Gene was talking about earlier, we're able to do that in outpatient surgery centers with 23-hour observation stays, maybe with a few days at rehab. There is you know, some time for healing because there's a bone graft and a healing phase. Um, but once it's done, you're unlikely to have ongoing recurrent problems at those levels. So I want to talk now about some of the techniques that we use in order to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish depending on the situation. So there have been several new advances in spinal surgery over the last decade or so. And one of them has been uh, the use of minimally invasive techniques. So this is the ability to do what we had done traditionally through big open incisions using very, very small incisions. So here's an example of something where we use these small little tubes. We put one and then another and then another. And we just sort of move the muscle fibers aside. And we can come down, look down into the spine with microscopes, something like this for, say, a herniated disc. We can do very little muscle disruption, a small two centimeter incision, you go home the same day, and very, very effective for what used to be a big incision and a lot of trauma to the soft tissues and to the muscles. Now we can do it through very, very easy means without a lot of surgical pain. So this is uh, one of the things that we do. Similarly, we can actually address even larger areas of narrowing around the nerves through minimally disruptive techniques. And there's a variety of techniques that are published. This is one technique where we come in on one side only, but we can actually clean out everything that's causing compression on the nerves, just doing a one-sided approach and maybe just a little bit of muscle disruption on the one side. There are some other techniques. This is a device that came out a little while ago that's kind of a little shaver that we can pass through the canal and shave down some of those bone spurs. This is just an example of showing what we can do here on the side with the shaver as opposed to a more traditional technique that leaves part of the joint and part of this bone spur still intact. So there's a variety of new techniques that have come out recently that have allowed us to do this. Now, 
Fusion, I talked a little bit about trying to preserve motion and replace things. There's a lot of stuff that has come out over the last decade to try to preserve motion. These are examples of disk replacements. So we put these into the disk space to try to maintain motion. Uh, there are some alignment rods that have flexibility capability. There's other um, devices here that are meant to try to straighten up the spine without fusing it. And this was something that has sort of fallen out of favor or never really gained any traction. But this is some replacements for the joints. So there are some techniques to try to replace them. I would say the jury's still out on some of these devices. Uh, others have actually gained uh, popularity and work very well. Um, our, in general, some of the instrumentation, the implants that we use, have improved on their technology, their strength, ability to get them in through very small incisions, or make us, uh, give us better tools for trying to correct things where we really uh, had a lot of tr uh, trouble or struggle in the past. So there are some great advances with some of our instrumentation. Uh, biologic. So in order to get bones to fuse together, we need them, we need something to kind of grow between them. And in the past, a lot of that came, well, from patients. We would take part of the bone from the pelvis. Some people still do. It's a very reliable way of using some bone graft to get things to heal. But this obviously causes a lot of pain. And nowadays, there's a lot of other products that are on the market available to us that can do the same thing so we don't need to cause additional surgical pain and trauma. There's different ways that we can now approach the spine. This has helped us tremendously in trying to get people back to function quickly. Um, we can go through the front, move the blood vessels out of the way. Uh, this generally requires a vascular surgeon or a general surgeon to kind of come around behind the bowels and the blood vessels. There's other ways here through little tubes that come through the muscle where we can get into the front of the spine. There's other ways through the back or even from the side. This is something that's been developed over the last decade or so, and this particular side approach has allowed us to do a lot more particularly in the field of scoliosis correction or minimally invasive type of surgery. And I'll kind of show you a little bit of what that looks like. This is a patient who had a scoliosis or a curve that I've kind of outlined here, maybe a little exaggerated, but coming through the side and bending the table, we can actually kind of straighten out part of the spine uh, like this, just in the positioning, and then come through the side using about one or two incisions and get multiple levels of fusion to try to correct some of these curvatures. And I'll show you a couple cases in a second. So here's a, an example, just a case example. This is a 62-year-old female who I saw a number of years ago. And she came in complaining of back pain, but primarily right leg pain. And she came in walking, leaning way over to the left. Uh, this is kind of a backwards view. So she's leaning off to the left. We took an x-ray like we always do. We saw this very significant curve. And ordinarily, you'd think, well, that's a terrible curve. She's shifted off to the left. Maybe she needs something you know, pretty extensive. Well, as it turns out, when we got an MRI, she just really had a disc herniation, and it was pressing on the nerve. And the reason she was leaning over to the left was to give that nerve on the right just a little bit more room. And so this is a patient where really this was the only problem that she had. She ended up needing surgery. We did it through a very small approach, just through about a two centimeter incision. We took out that disc herniation, took the pressure off the nerve. Her spine straightened up magically, didn't need a major extensive surgery. So just an example of what we can do, which seems like a pretty large uh, problem to begin with. Here's another case. This is a 73-year-old uh, lady who I saw several years ago. She had back pain. She had leg pain down both sides. She had trouble walking even more than a block. This is a very typical situation that I see. A little bit of numbness in the legs. And if you look at that x-ray, you can see that this is sort of out of alignment with respect to this one. You can see it sli slid forward maybe about a third of the distance. So this is that condition we were talking about earlier. This is degenerative spondylolisthesis. She had pinching of the nerves. There's the diagram here, the slipping of L4 on L5. And this is a, um, a patient that can be very well dealt with with a small operation through the back. We put in some screws to kind of hold each bone as an anchor. And then we use these rods to connect it and to line it up. 
We put a little spacer into the disk space to help with fusion and to help keep it lined up. We take the pressure off the nerve. And this is a fairly small surgery. It generally requires a day or two in hospital, something that we're able to do here very, very easily. This is another case. This is a 42-year-old um, gentleman, a little bit younger. He's had surgery before for a disc herniation. So he's already had an operation. He's had some scar tissue back there where the nerves are. And now he's got um, recurrent pain. Pain's come back. He's got back pain, he's got left leg pain. It's been getting worse over the last three years or so. And so he's had surgery. Now what we're looking at here is a CT myelogram, what's kind of outlining the nerves. You can see it's dark just in this area, and that's because the nerves are all being squeezed. So for him, um, we had tried a considerable conservative treatment, uh, but this has been going on now for approximately three years. He ended up needing surgery. Because of the scar tissue in the back, we were able to come in just from the side. It's about an inch incision or so. And coming from the side, restore the alignment, get those levels off of each other, distract a little bit, which takes the pressure off of the nerve. We can put in a little spacer to hold it up, a little plate and screws, and basically that's day surgery. You can go home the same day. So quite a nice approach for what could have been also a fairly big problem. Here's another case. This is a 66-year-old um, who had a very different problem. She was previously very active, hiking, uh, ballet, and she had a slow decline over years and years. And now she got to the point where she couldn't really walk more than a couple of blocks. She had chronic pain. She couldn't stand up. Um, she had a little bit of leg pain, but it was primarily back pain. And you can see from these x-rays, she's got this fairly substantial curve. She's kind of shifted off this way to the left, and she's stooped forward. So she's got a much bigger structural problem. This was not from a disc herniation like that first case I showed you, but this really is a big structural problem causing a stoop posture, leaning off to the side, and severe degeneration. Now, this is not one that is amenable to a small, minimally invasive surgery. However, that surgery I'd shown you before through the side allows us to get a fair bit of correction um, and get a lot of that correction done through a minimally invasive approach. Obviously, we have to kind of hold this together, but this is how we get her straight. We get her upright with a much more kind of natural curve, got her standing up straight, and she was able to return to full function. Um, I want to just change gears a little bit and talk about some of the other technology that we've been using. And this has to do with navigation and robotics. So in general, when we think about these, these new technologies, and this is a way of looking into the spine without seeing everything. There's really two components to this. There's an imaging component, so how do we see the spine? And then there's a guidance component. How do we do something to the spine? The imaging and how we see, you can think about it in different ways. There's a timing. Do we get the imaging before the surgery? Do we get the imaging at the time of surgery? There's CAT scans. There's intraoperative x-rays, fluoroscopy, so we can take x-rays during surgery. And all of those things can give us a picture of what the spine looks like. And using computerized software and matching it with some sort of guidance system, it allows us to use tools in different ways to do different things to the spine, depending on what we're trying to accomplish. Now, the guidance can be done real time, where you don't really plan it, but you've got instruments that you can manipulate, and it appears on a screen looking at the image of the spine that we were looking at before. Or you can do kind of a pre-planned uh, navigation system where you've planned everything in advance and then when you're in surgery you then execute it and accomplish what you need to accomplish. So these are different devices really for looking at the spine during surgery. This is an intraoperative CAT scan. So during surgery, patients asleep, we can wheel this in and get a CAT scan of the spine during the surgery. This is another way of getting a CAT scan. These are different instruments that are used to manipulate tools with a camera set up here and a screen. And you can see where these instruments are in space on a screen. So it tells you where you are, where you're headed, where you're starting on the spine, what direction you're going. 
and you get, uh, this is kind of what it looks like, it looks pretty blurry to me, but this is an intraoperative CAT scanner, this is some uh, navigated instruments, and this is what you might see on a screen. So it's showing you where your instrument is pointing, where it's starting, what direction it's going in, and if you wanted to insert maybe a screw into this bone, it'll show you exactly where you need to be and what angle to pick. Now, when you've got more complicated anatomy, patients that have curvatures, they've had prior surgery where things look distorted, that's where these tools are particularly useful. Now, robotics is something that accomplishes the same goal, but totally different technology. And this is the robot that most people think of when you think of robotic surgery. This is the Da Vinci. Um, and essentially, there's two components. There's a bunch of arms that are that are uh, moving, and then there's a workstation where you can manipulate it in space. Now, this is kind of the original uh, definition of a surgical robot, and this came out in the late 70s, but essentially this robot, or any robot for that matter, is some sort of manipulator that can be programmed that can move material or tools or special devices through different motions that are programmed either at the time or beforehand to perform a variety of tasks. That's essentially what it is. Now, this is the robot that was designed for spine surgery. This is the robot that I use. There's actually a little demonstration out here in the other room if anyone cares to have a look at it. So this robot is about the size of a soda can, so it's not a particularly large robot, but it's attached to a workstation. And what it does is it sort of moves uh, the top relative to the bottom in space according to our plan that we've created in advance, when we plan it in advance. And then there's a series of different arms that attach and essentially line us up for making a hole or doing some specific task that we want it to do. So this is kind of what it looks like on the inside. There's a series of telescoping limbs that allow the top to move relative to the bottom. That's essentially what it looks like. And so at the end of the day, what it allows us to do is to uh, create an accurate and predictable path, even through complex anatomy. It allows us to do uh, maybe repetitive motions where you might drill, we might want to feel where that hole is, and it can hold it for long periods of time, as opposed to the other technique where we've got an instrument moving in space and we have to kind of line it up on the uh, screen. And it can move to different locations uh, as long as we sort of send it and tell it where to go. Um, there's a few different components to it and a few different steps. But in a nutshell, there's software that we use to plan it, there's a workstation, this is the robot, and we kind of mount it somewhere hovering over the spine so it can reach those angles. And it's got about a millimeter of accuracy that's sort of built into the system. So it's a highly accurate system. There's four main steps. As I said, we kind of plan this in advance using a CAT scan. We get a blueprint. We know exactly where we want things to go. Uh, that's the first step. That's done in advance of surgery. It can be done any time. Uh, the second and third and fourth are all occurred during the time of the surgery. So we have to mount it. So we can use a variety of different platforms, a clamp or some sort of frame that sits over the spine. Once we've mounted it and it's rigid and attached to the spine, we then have to match it so it knows where it is. So we take a couple of x-ray images, we match it to the CAT scan that we did before, and then once it's matched, it's essentially ready to go and we're ready to operate. And then we can send it to different stations along the way, depending on where it tells us it needs to be to reach whatever we need to reach. So that's essentially how it works. Um, there's been over 2,000 procedures worldwide. This, this slide may be outdated. Over 12,000 implants. It's been used in a variety of places, basically all over the world. Uh, I've been using it for about five or six years now, and it's been a great tool in my practice. Uh, this was one of the early studies that came out showing that where these screws are being placed using the robot, its accuracy is about 98%. That's certainly a lot better than um, typical situations where about 10, uh, where, where about 10% uh, or even more are actually misplaced a little bit. Now, the good news is even if they're off a little bit, it's rare that they cause a problem, but it is still can be a problem in our field. So 98.3% is pretty good. This is essentially what it looks like. This is a plan here. This is what we see. We see these virtual screws and we can move them around in space on the planning. Uh, once we've got our plan, we save it and we load it up at the time of surgery. This is what it looks like during surgery where the robot is hovering over the spine. 
And you can see here we use a series of tools to drill the hole that we need. And this might be a picture of a pre-operative plan, and this is a CAT scan afterwards showing screws going exactly where we had planned. So the advantage really, I think, of this little device is it reduces the amount of radiation or x-ray that's required during surgery because all we need to do is just match it with a couple of pictures and not take continuous x-rays all the time. It allows us to get things done in a more efficient manner which may result in less bleeding, um, less surgical pain, we don't have to expose quite so much, and then obviously the accuracy which I just uh, talked about before. Now there are people that use this for minimally invasive approaches, works very, very well. Is it all worth it? I don't know, I'm not entirely sure. But in cases like this, where there's been surgery, multiple surgery, screws that aren't supposed to be there, and now you're not quite sure where you're going, this is really where uh, the robot performs extremely well. So in my practice, I deal with a lot of patients that have had prior surgery, uh, a lot of curvature, so patients with severe deformity, prior fusions, prior surgery, and this is a tool that works extremely well. As I said, it reduces x-ray, reduces blood loss, shortens the uh, <coughs> operative time, and really makes things much more efficient. So here's a couple of examples just with the use of the robot. This is a lady who I saw who was 58. She had a uh, curvature, had a scoliosis. In fact, this was a scoliosis that she had in childhood that just kind of progressed through adulthood. Now, if you look at this bone, this is traditionally where we put our screws. Now, this, this little area here, there's really no room for a screw. And even this one, you'd be hard pressed to be able to make sure you get a screw in there accurately because of the size of that little bone bridge. Now using the software, we can plan exactly where we want it to go. Here's a picture before, this is after, with the correction of the curve. And you can see this CAT scan with that screw going just exactly where we want it to go. There's really not much room for error on these. Uh, here's another uh, patient that I looked after. This is a 40-year-old lady who had uh, quite severe scoliosis that was kind of neglected in childhood and she was collapsing on herself, was having trouble walking, having trouble breathing, and her quality of life was dec declining quite substantially. Now you can see from her x-rays and her CAT scan, her anatomy was anything you know, but normal. So finding exactly where we're going to place these screws in this type of spine, very difficult to do without some sort of enhanced visualization or guidance system. Uh, this is just the correction afterwards. Obviously, she still has some curvature. It's hard to get it perfectly straight, but we got her chest up out of her pelvis, got her standing up straight, and she was uh, back to full function in about six months total, but up walking. She was probably about three or four inches taller. Yeah. So now she actually, interestingly enough, she had a short leg because she had a, I'm going to get into the details, she had a neglected uh, nerve problem and it caused one leg to grow shorter. So we had to kind of keep this pelvis tilted in order to accommodate the short leg. But she's up balanced, her head is centered over her hips, and she's up straighter and taller. But a difficult case. This is another lady who's had actually about five or six surgeries, and she's got what we call flat back syndrome. Uh, the surgeon who put these rods in, I guess, didn't read the instructions. We're supposed to bend the rods to accommodate the real spine. You know, they come out of the box straight, but you're supposed to bend them. So <clears throat> she couldn't stand up straight. No wonder. She had no curve in her low back. And she had other problems. The rods were broken. She had uh, areas that weren't healed. Here's her CAT scan and her myelogram. This is an area where the nerves are pinched. This is the picture I showed you before where the screw was once in the right spot and now no longer. You can see the area that healed, healed crooked, and these areas that didn't heal are the only ones that are straight. So a bit of a disaster type of case. Uh, this is one where we use the robot to plan, okay, well we want to put a screw here, we need to do a correction, and it just helps facilitate getting those implants exactly where we want doesn't necessarily do the overall correction, but it does help. So here's just the before and after, and you can see now she's got a curvature in her low back and she's standing up straight. We got her up straight this way, uh, and then we got her up straight from the side view. And here's just some photos before and after, and you can see how now she's properly aligned uh, in these photos. 
This is another one. <clears throat> this is a 38-year-old, a very a young girl who had scoliosis, multiple surgeries. Unfortunately, they didn't quite uh, do what they needed to do. Again, she had some broken rods. She's toppled over quite a bit and leaning off to the side. Again, a very similar situation. And you can see this is the afterwards where we got her up straighter. We got her straight this way. And then here's pictures with her before and after up to baby, you know, being able to stand up straight, returning to kind of normal life. And then this is just, I think this is the last case I'm going to show. Uh, otherwise, we're all going to get tired of this. This is a 60-year-old who I looked after a number of years ago. She also had scoliosis, multiple surgeries, braced for years, about four years. Um, really never healed properly. And what did heal, again, healed in a very curved orientation. Back pain, leg pain inability to stand up straight. You can see here are photos here, leaning off to the side, really trying to work hard to get herself up using her hips. And you can see this x-ray here with a broken screw and a fairly severe curvature. You can see she's leaning off to the side. This is just kind of outlining the side of her spine. So it's kind of heading over this way and back this way. So a very abnormal spine and a very difficult problem. This is the CAT scan. And this is all previous surgery, fusion, a very severe curve. Nothing looks normal here. You wouldn't be able to recognize this as a spine. So this is where the robot is extremely helpful here. Uh, we basically um, plan it out with the robot. We plan exactly where we're going to put all of our implants. We send the robot. It shows us exactly where to make our hole. We drill our little screw, and then we get the correction as necessary using the traditional techniques that we do. And you can see that she's up straighter. She's got a little curve in her low back. And you can see before and after and how she's up straighter now in the orange than before when she was in the purple. So just to kind of wrap this up, I just want to summarize. <clears throat> Some of these degenerative conditions of the spine really are quite common. What I've shown you are really much more of the severe extreme end but there's a whole spectrum from more mild, moderate, and then down to severe. For most of these, the vast majority, most people are very, very well treated with non-surgical treatment. The mainstay really in, in my practice is physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, maybe injections as necessary. And for most of those patients, that's really all that they do need. Surgery uh, is beneficial in a select minority of cases, but they're clearly defined instances. We don't operate on everyone who just has back pain because they haven't gotten better. There really needs to be a structural problem that we're addressing. And um, what I've tried to highlight here is that the technology really is advancing. Uh, it's helping us care for these patients in better ways, really trying to achieve what we're able to achieve, doing outpatient surgery, minimally invasive surgery, and even what I would consider maximally invasive surgery in a much more efficient manner. And the robot is one modality for achieving this, but it's allowing us to do things in a safer way, a more accurate way, and a more efficient way. So I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm happy to answer questions. I hope everybody enjoyed watching our lecture tonight on spine surgery and scoliosis. If you have any questions, you're welcome to call the office for further information. Thanks very much.